beard going really good now. Oh, yeah, 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 thanks. <laughs> I thought I'll just uh, stick to the beard for a while. How are things with you? Good. It's um, definitely winter here. It's okay. freezing. I can imagine. All right. And we had a drought recently. I don't know if you heard about um, yeah, that. I, 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 I still listen to Auckland radio while I drive or do anything. So I kind of know what's going on over there. Um, they're, yeah. they're encouraging uh, the citizens to save on uh, water usage and stuff, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and we had like a whole bunch of rain. Uh-huh. All right. I yeah. wasn't expecting that from Auckland. Well, I think it's uh, the population's grown so much that they okay. haven't really kind of managed the water resources. All right. What, what actions yeah. are the gov- is the government taking to uh, resolve that situation? They are borrowing water from Waikato River. Okay. But that's a temporary uh, so, solution, right? Well, for now. For now. I mean, okay. uh, they're still... I think it's also water is like educating everyone about water usage. All right. I think if you're from Asian countries or say from Africa, you know how valuable water is and you don't really waste it. True. (laughs) While here, no one really thinks of it as a finite resource. That is what surprised me, like that happening in a first world country. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite common over here. We get water cuts and power cuts in Sri Lanka. Like it's, it's totally normal. I've experienced it my entire life. But yeah. hearing that happen over there was like surprising to me. Yeah, even that's uh, like, um, let's see. Um, there's been a bit of rain, so it's not gonna, they're gonna not go up more drastic levels. Okay. Or at least for now. Um, and yeah, I think borrowing, like taking water from Waikato River, that's gonna, and that'll save quite a bit of um, pain. Okay. And also with tourism completely dead still, no one coming in. Okay. There's not as much water usage in, say, like hotels and like right. everywhere else. And I also heard that it is prohibited, temporarily prohibited to uh, use water hoses outside your garden. Yeah, uh, yeah. That feels like a With third world country. <laughs> yeah, so so thankful for the rain. Otherwise, okay. uh, the backyard's going to be dead. True. <laughs> it's been crazy since um, I came back from Colombo. It went pretty south pretty fast right like yes. i came back for about fourth or fifth of feb yeah new zealand government basically said everyone needs to come back by the 15th of march right. and we went into full lockdown by 22nd or 23rd okay i mean it's a challenging thing like i want to finish the documentary but by the same token like the health the and pandemic so. we are in, it's like a global pandemic and you just can't risk it. Like stories like this can wait. Yeah. Um, and one of the things you go through is, okay, how can I finish this documentary with the least amount of pain? Okay. So or, uh, originally I was supposed to film in Macau as well yeah. on the Asia trip, but Macau had shut down. And I have to finish, like, originally I was planning to go to Lisbon and Amsterdam start of April. Okay. All of that got cancelled. All right. So looking at the overall story on how it all shaped up, uh-huh. I think just shooting Lisbon okay. could be enough to complete the story. All right. But even now, like, even though New Zealand's got a good control over the virus and a lot so european union has just opened up travel to new zealanders okay you don't need to quarantine when you go travel there oh seriously okay Uh, but the flip side is you come back it's mandatory 14 day quarantine all right and the government okay 
Yeah, the government advises us right now, anyone who's coming back, like citizens or permanent residents, government's taking them the cost. So effectively, the taxpayer is bearing the cost of the quarantine. Okay. But if you travel for leisure or for non-essential purposes, yeah, the government's saying they're looking into how the user pays for that quarantine because you're looking right. at like two to three grand. It makes sense. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'm pretty much in a holding pattern waiting till I see that it is actually safe to travel. Everyone's opening up their borders and everyone's opening up travel, but it's, it's crazy. Like the pandemic is still on. It's not like everyone's True. controlling. Yeah. The cases have come down, mm. but that's how cases explode again. Like you're True. letting people just travel freely. Okay. New Zealand has yeah. been uh, have been handling it uh, really well, according to how the rest of the world sees it. So, what's your personal yeah, opinion it, living inside right now? Well, it's been really good. I mean, for one, like the government's like right from the word go. It was, I think, the reason New Zealand's done well is the communication was clear, and the politicians didn't go about politicking they okay. just handed okay. over everything to the health officials and as far as the whatever was coming from the government was the advice that the health officials were giving okay. so they're like this is where we are at this is what we are doing so it was very clear steps okay so the messaging was clear so everyone followed the rules and that meant that we were lucky coming out of it unscathed in a way. All right. So compared to uh, Australia, how, how, how well is Australia handling it compared to New Zealand, I mean? So following the news, like when we were like a week or two weeks into lockdown, Australia was still having this crazy, they, were, they went into strict lockdown a lot later than New Zealand. Like we had seen the news that people like there was everyone was on the beach and like you're like what are you guys doing? Yeah, yeah. The gov the Australian government was saying the virus is here, but people were not taking it they seriously. They didn't seem to care, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering how that was possible. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the bigger the population, it's obviously harder to control the messaging. I reckon, and yeah. I think what the pandemic has shown us like how crucial good leaders are in such big crisis. True. And it's about good communication. I agree. 100%. And if you're not communicating, you're just putting people's lives at risk. Yeah. How about um, Colombo or how about Sri Lanka? Like, oh, uh, Sri Lanka has handled it extremely well. That was totally uh, unexpected. Yeah, um, that's good. The president and the government, the military, the health officials, they're doing a great job and coming back to what you said it's great communication and i can see that happen yeah. over here too so yeah without that communication process like nothing's going to happen correctly yeah too much room for interpretation people in crisis need like clear guidelines yeah um here the government's also been good in providing like financial support and right. making sure because if the whole country is locked down People can't work, which means how do people wear bills? Like basically you're destroying the whole economy. Yes. New Zealand is primarily like, it depends on tourism. And suddenly okay. you've said no more tourists. True. So the support overall across the board has been really good. Cool. So that, okay. yeah, uh, I mean, it's going to take a while for the recovery. Yeah, definitely. But at least people are not uh, out of their homes or starving right now. Things here, because we are not allowing anyone in, there's no community transmission, there's no active cases. I mean, now the cases have come back, but those are people coming back from overseas. Okay. And all of them are being caught in quarantine. All right. But by and large, because there's no internal transmission, it's like nothing's ever happened. Okay. It's yeah. 
it feels a little bit emptier than usual because there's oh. no tourists. So the city feels empty. Yeah. And people still like a lot of companies still prefer working from home or at least okay. Okay. instead of doing five days of office work, they're doing like maybe two days from home and three days at the office. Okay. So um, yeah. in your opinion, like w would this changes like remain permanently, like the work, working style, uh, people's lifestyles, how, how, you know, people had to adjust and adapt. Would some of these remain permanent uh, in the future or would they just fade off as time passes? I think some changes might be permanent. Like okay. at least things where you don't have to be at the office to do the work. True. It gives people that work flexibility. Okay. And it also means for the companies that gives them a bit more flexibility in terms of how they manage the workforce. True. And it reduces the overhead costs. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's win 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 for both I, I, the I, I, employers I, I, and yeah. the employees. And uh, yeah, just not having to commute for like two hours a day. Who doesn't want that? Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. So some things are gonna stay the same. Which or you still need? Like, I mean things that will stay the same you still want human contact true you can't be at home the whole time because I that agree. obviously is not good for your mental health either yeah. you need to be able to communicate freely within the team true but yeah it's things are gonna overall i think we'll be looking at a very different world yeah i reckon too how has it affected your line of work? You work with the television industry. Uh, you closely work with the TV industry, right? So, yeah. So, so how has that reflected your work? So because I freelance at um, TVNZ, which is the broadcasting biggest broadcasting company here, it's been every, like media has been decimated because everything runs on advertising dollars. Okay. If the companies are not making any money, they're not going to advertise. If they're not going to advertise, it means you can't sustain as many people, True. and which means you can't buy good quality content. And content is not being made because global shutdown means no productions are happening. Yeah. So that cycle has been pretty devastating in New Zealand. I mean, not just TV and Z. Overall, like TV three's lost jobs, Sky's cutting jobs. Okay. Um, this, um, like, digital print media, they've lost quite a few jobs. With TV and Z, uh, personally for me, like the work's definitely cut down quite a bit. Okay. Even though I'm in operations, it's it's the same thing. Like you, wherever you make the cuts, it the easiest way to save costs is not have as many freelancers or don't give freelancers as much work. True. And then you look at how do you reduce the headcount within employees? So personally for me, it's been, it's been an interesting time. I mean, okay. work's definitely slowed a bit in saying that I have then gone, okay, what else can I do? And I've had like other clients who I've worked with previously some of their works picked up and because they've enjoyed working with me, I'm getting a bit more work from them oh, good. and okay. I'm picking up a bit more coaching, CrossFit coaching work. Oh, excellent. Okay. We'll get into that um, soon. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the reality is like, you can't just rely on one thing anymore. You have to do, be doing multiple things. Yes. Yeah. I mean, also like, the amount of time you have, some of the time you can now allocate for creative purposes. I agree. Um, for instance, a creative or things that I would like to do. So I know that I need to go to Lisbon for filming the remaining part of the documentary. Yeah. And I figured like, if I learn Portuguese, yeah, it would make it that much more interesting, which means if I spend like an extra day, then I can go more into the culture there True. because that bookends the documentary. Yes. So I've started learning Portuguese online. Yeah. So, I mean, 
the free time also lets you spread it in places where you couldn't originally devote that time. I don't know if this, if this is an appropriate question, but how far have you completed your current documentary? How far? So whatever I've shot, okay. it's all edited. It's you shared a link with me on uh, Vimeo. The overall cut, so the holes that are remaining are the cities that still need to get shot. So okay. I still need to shoot realistically Lisbon alone. All right. Will still let me release it as a one hour doco. Okay. But you but were aiming I, like a 90 minute doco? Uh, originally 90 minutes. Okay. But with just shooting Lisbon, I can release it as a one hour doco. All right. And again, like one of the things I've got to consider is post pandemic, the FA. Okay. So most of the airlines, they didn't offer refunds. They just gave credit. All right. So you can rebook at a later date. Okay. Otherwise they would have gone under, yes. which is totally understandable. And, um, the thing is going to be with not as many people traveling post pandemic and with not as many flight uh, flight routes okay um the fs are going to be more expensive and everything's going to be a bit more expensive than what we are used to all right so now i need to as a producer i need to consider what do I spend money on or even if it's possible to get cheap flights from Lisbon to Amsterdam, do I okay. shoot Amsterdam because then the cost in Amsterdam is going to be super expensive. I understand. So those decisions I'll probably look at once it's closer to the time when okay. travel is a bit more open. All right. So like, Give us a little bit, like a little background info about what inspired you to making CrossFit documentaries. This is your second one, right? Um, it's my second one. Like how, how did you get here? Because you, you made a couple of feature films, right? You made two feature films, one action thriller yeah. and then a horror. Yeah. And then you ventured into um, CrossFit documentaries. Yeah. I, I mean. I said it right. Yeah. Definitely. That was the sequence of events. So once I made my two feature films, then I also did a couple of years acting course. Okay. Uh, I studied acting for two years and then I was doing a bit more commercial work. All right. I was, and I was writing another feature film. Okay. And that fell through the cracks and I was kind of feeling disillusioned with the whole process. All right. And at that point, I had also fallen off the fitness bandwagon. Like I was okay. into fitness when I was in school and college, but since coming to New Zealand, nothing of that sort had happened. True. Like when, when I met you back in uh, 2006, I, I didn't yeah. uh, see that side of you. I didn't no. know that you were in like hard, hard into um, fitness. Yeah, that was new no. to me. Yeah. When, when I yeah, saw it like, I, later. I'd definitely fallen off the wagon at that point. Okay. And whenever I go to visit mom and dad in India, I usually stop in Asia. All right. And on one of the hill, hill tribe treks in Thailand, Nalan okay. Thailand. All right. It was a small hill. We were trekking and I was completely puffed on a small hill. Okay. And that was the, was like, okay, I need to get back into fitness. This is not good. And then when I saw some of my friends back home, they had like health issues quite, I mean, at that point we were like 28, 29. Right. And for seeing health issues in my friends, I was like, okay, I definitely don't want to be in a stage where I am having serious health issues at such a young age. Okay. And then I started doing a bit more fitness and then I kind of fell into CrossFit right. and I love the training method because yeah, I got fit really fast and it was, you had a good community of people. You form friends anywhere in the world really fast. Yeah. 
And somewhere in 2014, towards the end of 2014, I had like a big accident. Like I fell off a gymnastics bar because I didn't chalk up my hands and like okay. I was in ICU brain injury and all of that stuff. When was this? And through the, this was end of 2014. I had no clue. Like, I mean, uh, I do remember you talking about it when we met, like in yeah. Bed, but um, I didn't notice this on uh, social media because that's how we like know what's going on, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't really post much about it, and the doctors basically at that point had said like it would be a year for me to return to like normal functioning and like being able to get back into exercise all right uh, and that's where i think being healthy and fit is very important like i was back into fitness like a month from then starting my rehab exercises okay and i was back in like the recovery took a while a year all right to get back the strength where i was at but in saying that, uh, so at that point, when you're not allowed to do anything, which strains your brain, I was looking at what interests me. Okay. And I went, I still love media. I still like telling stories. I love CrossFit. And it's like, okay, I'll let me see if there's some way I can bring these two things together. All right. And as part of the process, then I ended up volunteering at uh, international events. Okay. Working with the media team. And at that point, I figured like, if I make a doc, if I can tell stories of different people from different cultures, yeah. uh, that would be like, a, no one was doing that. Everyone was telling stories about elite athletes. Okay. While I was more interested in the culture and normal athletes daily athletes i found that very and, interesting and um unique to a good extent like i, mean, yeah, I have and, i had not seen anything similar to uh, what you uh, did yeah thanks for that yeah um yeah uh, one of the things like i mean the personal side of things obviously that was my logical brain going i need to bring these two things together uh, because i love travel i love people i love culture but the background to that was growing up in India, you obviously, I mean, I'd say growing up anywhere in Asia, you have like huge amount of prejudice True. against someone from another country. Yep. Um, and I was not immune to that. And yep. once I came here to New Zealand, when you are exposed to different cultures and people, you grow as a person. And I went, actually, if I went through that journey, I'd love to actually be able to show stories which makes people travel and experience those cultures. Yeah. And once people actually go to a place to experience it, that changes the perspective on how they look at things. True. So that was my other motivation which keeps driving me forward even when you go through the creative lulls you know the creative process where you are uh, when you are in a creative high you're high but then you come through a low and you're like why am i doing this yeah so that usually drives me where like okay this was why i started it and i still like to do that okay and yeah um I pitched the idea to CrossFit HQ. They didn't quite understand what I was trying to say okay. or what I was trying to show. All right. I went, you know what? At that point, I was also getting a fair bit of freelance work, which meant I could save up. I saved up the money and I just decided I was going to do it on my own. Okay. I, I did the whole thing. Uh, off my own bat, like sorted out the interviews, contact athletes, all this producing stuff I did all beforehand right. and then shot it, edited it and showed it to CrossFit. And they okay. were still not quite convinced because they saw the rough cut. All right. And I started releasing it on my own. I, I released one episode and okay. quite a few people saw it. 
And a lot of people contacted um, CrossFit HQ going, hey, this is amazing. Like, why aren't you releasing it? Okay. So they came back to me and said, hey, okay, we'll release it. Um, and so I knew that there was definitely... So that was the first web series that I did. All right. And then continuing that journey, I then last year made it another six, seven cities as a feature film. Okay. And this one, I figured like the other part of the thing that I really loved when I was at school was history. All right. And food is yeah, okay. what I usually really, really love. And so that's used, uh... incredible. Yeah. It's um, when you travel, like food is such an important part of that experience. True. So I figured, okay, what's the thing, one thing in history that really kicked everything off? And I figured, like, Portuguese were known as the first colonials. Yeah. So for me, it was like, okay, it's an interesting way to look at things where I'm talking about colonization, I'm talking about transference of arts transference of culture i'm a result i'm and, a result of that lineage too so <laughs> yeah it's fascinating like it's yeah. um and not very many people kind of lean into it True. so i mean okay for me it's about exploring what is actually the case and it was fantastic. I mean, the trip in February was fantastic. Things that I found, like, I've been to Malacca, like, three times before. Okay. And it was only this time, like, when I was in, landed in Malacca, I was going around. I found out there was a Portuguese colony. All right. I didn't, like, the last three times I was there, I didn't know there was a Portuguese settlement there. And yeah, went to the Portuguese settlement, found that there was still Portuguese food being made over there, like with a bit more spices, Asian spices. But all of those discoveries, it's just amazing. It's really, how, really... A- how, how well was the Portuguese community in Malacca integrated with the local uh, community and the culture? Was it like balanced or you could see a difference like similar to uh, maybe in Goa? You could definitely see a difference. I mean, um, the Portuguese settlement, I don't know what the politics of the land is, but the Portuguese uh, uh, descendants over there, they are definitely struggling to have their voice heard and get things... All right. yeah, it's um, it's a common theme usually. Okay. Like you need, you need that um, support. That government support isn't there, and you could see there was a difference in the houses, the styles of houses in the Portuguese settlement. You, you mean the architecture, or yeah, architecture oh. and just the you could yeah, some of the houses were nice, but I'm not sure if uh, they could be at the same level as say uh, other Malay houses, which were around. All right. In terms of the state of the houses. Okay. If you uh, elaborate a little more, like uh, I I didn't quite understand that myself too. So like in terms of uh, living standards, are they below or above or in par? Below. Below. Okay. All right. Like at, at least the, Two, three days I was there when I was walking around. Yeah, it definitely felt below the uh, okay. rest of the standards. That may have uh, affected their education in some level? Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, All right. okay. if you spend like maybe a week there uh, and have local friends, then yeah, you'd probably get to know more. But when you're only in a place for like three, four days, like where I like doing documentary like this, where I'm in a place for three to four days, you're constantly on the go shooting. True. And you only catch glimpses of things. Okay. 
which is fine for the documentary but at some point i'd definitely love to go back and find out more about what's happening all right okay so talking uh, more about um your documentary so when the portuguese started this whole thing i mean the documentary at this point it's called spice and silk and i think i'll hold that title okay it sounds great um the reason being like spices were integral part of cooking in asia all the way through yeah and europeans needed those spices to preserve meat and okay. everything could go in land and arabs control the routes all right they would take a good chunk of the so it would go to venice most of the spices would end up at venice and arabs had a monopoly on the whole thing okay which meant anyway which in turn meant venice made a lot of money all right because then they would mark up so whoever controlled the spices controlled uh the political power threads all through europe okay it's that at that point that the portuguese and the spanish decide that they would try and find a separate route so that they didn't have to rely on um, venice okay so they didn't have to pay exorbitant amount of money all right for those spices and because of that one decision we know the world as it is at that point most of the world was still undiscovered okay uh spanish went further west while portuguese decided they were going to come east by going round cape of good hope all right uh try and cross africa okay then because of that spanish ended up finding latin america central america south right. america and the portuguese ended up finding a lot of parts of africa but also a lot of asia okay so that's there was huge improvements in navigation okay in science because they wanted to get to the spices all right without those technological improvements they wouldn't have made it okay so it kind of the world order changed because of that decision all right and also because they landed in kochi in india first and they colonized it they are known as the first colonials okay the portuguese and from that point on like it went further and further into southeast asia and then they get like the silk and porcelain from china okay traded for spices and they had spices so they bring all of that back to europe and they were they got very rich uh, the portuguese got rich but then after that obviously different empires had their phases true including the dutch the british the french okay yeah so for me it's a way of kind of exploring all of that and seeing what that journey has what is the remnant in today's world all right and how much of an impact it has had on the culture and what the influences of food have been like okay. if the influence on food was just one way or was it bidirectional and while i'm at it in terms of crossfit um the last documentary i was dealing looking at it from the point of health okay while this one because it is about trade right. it's about spice trade i figured like i should look at crossfit from the point of trade as well which meant talking to affiliate owners and talking about the business side of crossfit so that thematically it all ties in together that's really interesting so like uh, if uh, you're welcome if if my viewers uh, or the listeners uh, 
want to check out your your, your first documentary that is already released, what platforms uh, can they access them from? Yeah, um, this I've put up a few links. If you go to my website, digifit.co.nz, D I G I F I T dot co dot nz um there's links because it the documentary was picked up for distribution by gravitas okay. which means that certain countries don't have certain platforms all right but if you access the vimeo link is available worldwide okay but if you have preference for say you want a itunes link uh there's some restrictions but by and large if you're US, UK, most of Europe, iTunes is, iTunes and Google Play, you can find the documentary. Tell me a little bit about like how you came to be the person you are today. Like, I mean, you were born and raised in India and then you migrated to New Zealand out of all the other countries. So give us a little bit of insight about all that. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it's it's a hard question as well because um, I'd like to think that a lot of the choices I've made in life have been gut instinct choices. There's okay. been no super long thought put into things. All right. But at the same time, I know I take calculated risks. I'm not completely reckless. Okay. So when I was in India, I finished my MBA and I was kind of, I was in an IT marketing job and that was a killer because I'd spend like three hours a day commuting. Okay. And it was just, it was not fun. And I just couldn't see myself doing that for the rest of my life. All right. And also through my schooling years, I've, I've been good at most things uh, in terms of studies, uh, but also good at sports. In college, I didn't really have much of a direction, and I ended up choosing business because I figured, like, if you're if you're on the business side of things, you can give value to companies, and all, um, that was my thinking at that point. Okay. And my original plan was to try and go into biosciences or biotechnology, but the cutoff was so high and I just didn't meet the criteria because funnily enough in India, like you need to, if you're going into biotechnology and they don't look at just your sciences score, which is the okay. crucial component. All right. They look at your overall score All right. and my overall score used to come down quite a bit because of math. Okay. My math was not the best all scores right. at all. <laughs> Okay. Um, so for me, going into business side of things was kind of driven by that. And then I quit the job, which is quite unusual. And I was like, okay, I need time to think what I like doing. And I knew I was into creative side of things in school as well. Yeah. So I approached one of my friend's dad, who I knew was a writer director, okay. to ask for his guidance on how to do that. All right. Little did I know, like he was uh, like one of the top literature writers in India. Wow, and, okay. Like he was a legend. I just didn't know anything about it. You, you're talking said, about hey. your dad? Uh, no, my friend's dad. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and um, I went, okay, um, how do I get into this? He's like, you know what? I've got my assistants just finished up. I've got a position open. I can't pay you much, but if you want to come and assist, you can learn on the job. And okay. that's how I got into that. Got into media full time. All right. And through the process doing, I was production managing a feature documentary in India and not having the technical knowledge and education made right. the job so hard. Okay. And at that point, I knew I had to do film studies. And through that process, I was like, okay, one, I don't want to stay in India for this long. Okay. Because uh, the way the society was working over there would kind of drive me up the wall. All right. 
and I knew I had to get out of India and I knew I had to do film studies. So I started applying and I got into a, like a schools across the world, but New Zealand was the one that was like, it was a one year course at South Seas. All right. And I was like, okay, it's an English speaking country. It's a one year course. And having done like five years of study of college just before that, I was like, okay, one year I can definitely deal with it. And okay. yeah, took that leap. And yeah, that was how that decision came about. And you are a Kiwi now, a Kiwi. I am. Okay. I was very okay. lucky. I'm very, very lucky because uh, progressively over the years, every successive government has made it harder and harder for people to become citizens. Yeah. They've kept moving the goalpost. I was at the start of the process where I got my citizenship 2007, about right. four years or four and a half years. I came to New Zealand in 2003. Okay. And I got my citizenship by like my actual passport by 2007. All right. Okay. So I was very lucky. As you mentioned, like you didn't plan any of these, right? These were gut decisions that led you to uh, yeah. this path. Yeah. Um, this is some of the uh, conversations I usually have with uh, mom and dad. Okay. Where they, m my mom and dad, where they, they would have loved to have me do something different where it was a bit more stable or a bit True. more long term while okay. um, I picked something which I went, you know what, this is what interests me. Yeah. Why not do that? But what's important is you're happy, right? Totally. I mean, yeah. you still get the moments of happiness. You're like, ah, oh, maybe I should have listened to them. <laughs> but that's natural. Uh, but that has been, yeah. that's natural part of the process. Like, like, I mean, being creative and trying to get projects off the ground is just such hard work. And yeah. you probably know all about that as well. True. I could relate to it's that. just that whole up and down cycle that you go through. You just yes. can't avoid it. Say so the best you can do is have like good team around you yeah. who can um, make sure they pull you up when you're going too deep. Yeah, that's that's something very important and precious. When when we yeah. have a team, we should um, treasure it, right? Because we'll never totally. know when it's gone. Yeah. Absolutely. And having people you can trust, uh, who you can talk freely to, and just they know your thought process, you know their thought process. True. Yeah. You uh, did something amazing, at least uh, in my eye. Like when I was uh, looking to, you know, like improve and upgrade and further my uh, film knowledge, I uh, stumbled upon your story where you were this immigrant who moved to New Zealand and you made a no budget feature film. It was a big deal. Things have changed now, but, you know, considering the technology that existed and, and everything just in general, it for to me and, you know, some of the people I know, it was a big deal because you came from somewhere and did the impossible because there were Kiwis who couldn't do it. But you came from somewhere else and yeah. um, you made that happen and you inspired, you know, a lot of people um, to do that. So tell us a little bit about that, like how, how it all came together and what, what are the challenges you came across and how did you overcome them and, you know, all that. Yeah, I mean, so that one again, like I just finished off my school year at South Seas. Okay. Uh, which was December 2003. And I didn't want to go back to India and my uh, work, like the student visa was valid till like, I think end of February. Okay. And through the whole South Seas year, one of the things I used to do, uh, I could help out the school teaching school kid tour groups that came through. Okay. I teach them editing because they obviously didn't have enough resource at that point. So I'd go, yeah, you know what? I'm not doing anything on this day. I'll jump in and teach. Okay. So 
And Jamie Gardner at that point, who used to be the edit assist. All right. He was getting plenty of outside work. Okay. And he decided he wanted um, to go more industry work. All right. So there, there was an opening that came up for edit assist. And I put my hand up saying, hey, can I apply for this? Okay. Even though I'm not, I don't have New Zealand work visa and all of that stuff. And they're like, oh, you know what? You've been helping us with all of this. Definitely apply for it. And they went through, so they, naturally, I had a very good relationship with everyone, Gerben and Rob and David. And so they basically took me on board. And um, so that process was in January, but okay. end of December, I had no friends at that point here. I didn't All know right. anyone. Okay. I mean, uh, none of the uh, friends from South Seas at that point were in Auckland. I was basically okay. stuck in Auckland because right. I couldn't afford to go anywhere. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be in the country or not. Okay. And during that time, I went, you know, this, uh, I can keep worrying about things of what can be, what, what I can't do or I can try and do something with it. So I basically lock myself in the house. When I say lock, I'd still go out to grab food and stuff. But yeah, 14 days, 15 days, uh, I just sat and wrote a script that I thought I'd like to make. Okay. And once I made that script and the at the same time, the job thing turned up and I got my work visa, Okay. I then went, okay, I have a script. Why don't I actually just start the process of seeing if I can make it? All right. And I usually like to think out of the box. Like, I mean, I don't like to adhere to rules. So one of the first things I did was I showed it to Gerben at that point and he's like, oh, it's going to be hard. It's not going to work out trying to make a feature film with no money. And I basically approached, instead of going, I can't do it, I went, how can I do it? So I approached um, a couple of acting uh, agents okay. saying, hey, I'm someone completely new. Here's a script. I'd love to make it. And these are the people I'm looking for. All right. And Catherine Rawlings, she was amazing. She was so supportive. Uh, she sent some of the top professional actors uh, who she thought would be good for the role, okay. send them the script. And um, yeah, a couple of them said, yep. And they came on board and that got everything going again. One of my best friends, Lance, who same year he was a cameraman and he was on board from day one. He was like, yeah, okay. whatever you do. So once that started, once you have like some of the key people in, yeah. and then it's a matter of forward momentum and not having to pay anyone. It was a lot of the time I would hear why I couldn't do something. Okay. And I'd go, why not? Like, I mean, what's where does it say you can't do it all right so i went look can't pay anyone and everyone's got busy lives so why don't we do it over the weekends and okay everyone on, was on board with that and so some of the challenges came from like the scheduling aspect of it and just trying to make the movie look like it wasn't made on a low budget was the biggest challenge. All right. So trying to access good locations, uh, uh, finding beautiful houses, okay. which tied in with the story, trying to like, so all the things which you have to pay for, um, by and large, I approach people being very honest. Okay. Saying, hey, this is what we're doing. Can you help us? All right. Um, and 
then I had Benji, another of my friends who okay. did South Sea editing with me. He came back from the US to edit the project. Okay. So he edited the project. So it was good. It was the overall process. I mean, it's been such a long time thinking about the project. All right. The one the one main thing I remember from that project was people going, you can't do it. And mm-hmm. me going, no, we'll, we'll make it happen. We're going to okay. finish this. And for me, usually any project that I start, I need to finish it. It's a personal yeah. challenge for me. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's like you've given up on a fight. True. Um, and... I remember the first cast and crew screening. No one had seen it and we chucked it up on the big screen at South Sea's lecture theater. Okay. And everyone was blown away that we all created that. All right. And um, I distinctly remember Gerben, who was exec producer on it. Okay. He was seeing it for the first time and he was completely blown away with what right. we achieved because he was not expecting a no budget film to be like that all right yeah i mean it was it was an interesting process like i guess just being pig-headed at times okay um just being stubborn going you know what we're doing this and finding ways to work around find solutions yeah and get it done so did you approach like a guerrilla style or did you uh, um, actually uh, follow the, the standard traditional procedure where you, uh, you know, get permissions and process all the documents and all that? Oh, right. yeah. It okay. was all legit. Like legit. we okay. followed every single, like all location permits, like that was also part of the process, like dealing with Auckland council, dealing with hotels, like uh, there was a small stunt that we needed to do. So Rachel, she knew a stunt man and who offered to do the stunt for free. Okay. Which was a driving stunt. So we then find a location, get permit for the, for that street. Okay. And then, get permission from all the house owners or on that street all and right. then notify them when we were doing it. And like, so all of it, like it was like a proper film production. All right. The reason I brought that up was because like today, when we talk about no budget films, they are normally, most of them are guerrilla movies. Yeah. Where you just go point and shoot. Yeah. I mean, I guess it works so on the style of the film. All right. When you have a full script and you want to achieve it as close to how you're envisioning it, true. you want to do it properly, even if it takes maybe two or three days more. Uh, how long uh, did the post-production take? Hmm. Um, so the post-production, like it was not... so. I'd let Benji do the edit, like he'd show me the cut okay and then i'd go and and go oh that one yeah that one not so good and we talk things through uh as opposed to me sitting with him the whole time all right um, so i think that was uh, maybe a couple of months okay where he spent on that all right yeah and that was a good process because yeah uh, obviously I'm trained as an editor, so the temptation for me would be if I'm sitting, trying to dictate I, what the edit is going to be. True. I was um, just going to ask So the question. only, yeah, the thing I said to Benji before the edit started was, I instead of trying to tell him what the story should be, because he had the script, he knew exactly what the script said, I said, visually, I want it. It's a beautiful poem that's disintegrating. Okay. That's what the feeling should be when you're watching it. Wow, okay. And that's what he used that 
as the guiding principle for the edit. All right. Yeah, so for me, it was going in occasionally, going, oh yeah, definitely on the right track with that, or mm, not quite sure, change that. Okay. Yeah. So coming back to your CrossFit documentaries, uh, something that I really liked about it is it looked good. To me, it looked, it, it was in par with anything you would watch on Discovery Channel, like, you know, almost, or maybe sometimes yeah. in par. But my point yeah. is like a normal person wouldn't understand that now since I have a trained eye, I can tell the difference. But yeah. with a general audience, I don't think they'd be able to tell a difference between like, you know, a high value uh, television production and what you had done. So yeah. how did you achieve this all by yourself? Because I, I uh, was lucky enough to experience uh, a couple of days with you and you just carry your little camera and, you know, your other uh, gear all in one backpack and you just go around yeah. and <laughs> shoot what you want. And then once we see the final product or even the rough edit, it looks, this is my opinion. It looked really good. Yeah. Um, Thanks. <laughs> I mean, that's really encouraging as well because um, with the documentary, like when you're doing something like this, like, you're, it's like writing. You're working in a vacuum for most of the time. Uh, yeah. Also, I'm the crew, which means yeah. I'm the only person involved with the process end-to-end -end for now, which means it kind of makes things easy. Okay. Uh, easy and hard at the same time. Hard because it's obviously a lot more strain on your creative energy yeah. and energy overall because you're having to do multiple roles at the same time. But it's also very easy in terms of, I just only have to worry about one person, that's me. Yeah, so okay. if I know it gives me the flexibility, if I know something else is happening during the shoot, I can just change my perspective. Okay. And it's... Um, Similar to how we were talking about guerrilla style or, or having a scripted project that you want to bring to life with the vision that you have. Yeah. So I like to write out what I think is the story for that place. Okay. So I have a rough script on me. All right which means then I can visualize what kind of shots I need, which also means when I'm on the ground, I'm looking for the shots. Okay. And then anything on top of that is a bonus and being open to the experience. So if I see, for instance, when we were filming at the Angampura the scene, uh, scene. center, uh, yeah. It was an awesome setting. When I saw the boys uh, climb up the tree yeah. using the roots that were hanging, I knew that there would be something along those lines. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. Okay. So I was like, okay, straight away, even though I knew there was a couple of people doing their practice, martial arts practice, Visually, for me, it was more interesting showing something that no one else would have captured before. True. Okay, so if you want to share some of your uh, experience, knowledge, and wisdom with the young filmmakers who are extremely fortunate with today's technology, when they can carry a little iPhone and um, get very good video quality. Um, yeah. You know, since since we are all living in such a great time when it comes to film technology. Um, yeah. What advice can you uh, share with these, you know, people? Um, I could say, tell a good story. Uh, technology is just a tool. Because I know I mean, many talented people, if I am, uh, if I may disturb you for like a moment, like, yeah. um, they have great ideas, they have great skills, great vision, 
extremely creative, but um, they are too concerned about what camera they're going to shoot it on. They all want to shoot on Red or Arri. Um, what software they're going to cut it on and, you know, grade it on. And, yeah. um, you know, I've noticed things slow down and eventually uh, most of these projects never end up uh, happening or they kind of like never complete. So um, talking to a, a lot of people that I personally know who's, uh, who's experienced this, um, what advice can you give since, you know, you're in a position where you can, you have like films released out there. Yeah, I definitely like technology should be the last thing you should be worried about. It's the story, like without story. And more than that, it is why you want to tell that story. Okay. Uh, you're not going to finish the project. Like the creative process is just so long that if you don't have a good why, you're not going to get to the end. Sure. You need to know what is driving you to tell that story. Okay. So that's one big, big thing. Like it's also part of the thing that we do in fitness. Like oh. why are you doing what you're doing? Like if you don't know why, you're not going to hold on for very long. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'd say is be respectful of people. Uh, whenever we do creative projects, we are asking a lot of people to share their energy with us. Okay. Uh, and if there's no respect, people don't share that energy with you. Right. And when that energy is not there, it shows up on screen, whether you like it or not. And this okay. energy I talk about is right from your crew to your cast to people who are not directly involved with the project, even even people you need to take permissions from or people you're interviewing it's or photographing, whatever it is, you need to be respectful of their energy and they okay. need to see that you're respectful of, of that energy. Okay. And it makes the process easier for everyone. And creatively, it's a lot more satisfying. True. Thanks for that. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, that is what I'd like to think that I do when I do documentaries. So I like to be respectful. So even if I'm shooting something, if someone says no, I don't wanna, I don't want you pointing the camera at my side. You just go, okay, fine. Yeah. Don't point it, it at their side. They yeah. don't wanna be in it. I personally have uh, been shooting like a travel documentary for my wife. Like, you know, she wanted to have her own IG and like a following. And I wanted, since, you know, I, I had that background, I, I started, you know, like we started traveling from hotel to hotel. And since I'm linked to that trade uh, through the family, um, uh, we thought like we would travel from hotel to hotel and share our experience as a family. I had to do something very similar that you did, but with two kids and a wife. Um, so I came across a lot of challenges. Yeah. It was great to do everything by yourself. I guess that's the plus point, as you mentioned. But at the same time, it could be extremely tiring and frustrating because before, yeah. you, uh, before you start, you were like, oh, wow, cool. This is so cool. We got to go to different hotels and experience all that. But it was one living hell when I actually started doing it. Yeah, you are taking on two completely different roles and trying to True. fulfill both roles equally well. Yeah. So I found that Which extremely is so hard. hard. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even so have hard. my meals in most cases, like, cause I was just, you yeah. know, covering as much as I can. And yeah. Um, so yeah, it was quite yeah. hard. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring that up. So when people, go, oh, you're filming all of this stuff. It's amazing. You're, with, you're traveling, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, it's great. I'm traveling, but it's not, I'm not taking a holiday. True. I'm That's working. something a lot I'm of people still, don't see, huh? Yeah. Yeah. 
it's like i'm not going to say i'm going to kick back for two days no I, straight away i'm going what can i film like you're mm. constantly on the move constantly filming especially documentary yes you're documenting things so and and yeah. you never really rest once you return home like you back on your edit suite cutting yeah. and, you know like <laughs> going through the rushers and picking the music and like it's it's extremely tiring that's what i realized um, yeah it's very tiring yeah. um with this documentary so i had to make that conscious choice not to take the laptop with me all right Because that is something I new go... to me that that's something i was like wondering where is his laptop because i was carrying my laptop everywhere and that was annoying to set it up you know look for a table in every hotel and clear the table yeah. set it up and um yeah, that's something very important i learned from you yeah um i mean that's the whole process that i found like because it is so exhausting where you just can't switch off i think it impacts on the quality as the project goes on because you're just so involved so what i tend to do is i take enough memory cards on me i have enough okay. memory cards on me so i um, don't have to back it up and i'll edit once i finish one leg of the journey okay uh, that means end of the day come back to the hotel go to sleep Relax. get a good night sleep okay otherwise the next day's filming is not going it's going to be tough okay so you would advise on purchasing as much as memory cards possible and in yeah, the in batteries too or yeah okay i uh, so most of the weight of my camera bag is from the batteries okay all right um uh, and it depends on the camera most of the cameras now so the big reason for carrying your laptop would be to back up all the memory cards so that if something happens you have that footage on another drive so most of the cameras now have dual dual card slots and you can set it to dual record okay. so whatever you're recording records on to both cards so you have a automatic backup copy okay with saves not having to carry a laptop all right yeah that's so worthwhile just having oh. like a camera that can do dual slots what camera did you use primarily and you had like a second action camera too oh uh, so yeah so i'm using a gh5 i've been using okay. gh5 since it came out amazing okay. camera for video uh i usually carry it depends on the project i usually carry one just one lens okay that's on the camera or sometimes two lenses all right so on this project i've been carrying two lenses all right uh one is the 12 to 35 mil it can so zoom lens and the okay. other is a 35 mil prime So if I'm doing interviews where it's more control I'll use the prime lens okay. because it looks amazing while if I'm out and about I'll use a 12 to 35 which means I can get the shots with as I'm seeing them without having to kind of run to the shot which you okay. have to if you're prime lens and the other camera is the Osmo action okay it's similar to a GoPro all right it's good for getting action shots or just doing handheld selfie shots where you're doing piece to camera so um uh, low light conditions you know that's quite common uh with this form of film making so how do you uh achieve best picture quality um in situations like that with not many lights you depend on natural lights around you yeah so definitely the prime lens okay saves me in like low light situations i automatically switch to that all right the prime lens is a manual lens so it's a lot more work on focusing um focusing but the good thing is like you get like because it's tactile you get used to it actually i have it here 
uh, uh, this is uh, similar to like a film camera. Um, yeah. So it it's very it's not slippery, and yeah. yeah, you get like a really nice. You get used to how much you need to turn for a particular distance. Makes life so much easy, and footage looks good when it's in low okay. light because that particular lens has a f stop of point nine five. All right, so that's really good for low light. Yeah, very very good for low light. So my podcast show is not actually focused on filmmaking or the technical or marketing aspects of it because I think there is there are plenty of um, podcasts and. Since I come from like a technical background, yeah. I, I end up talking a little more about it. But uh, what I want to do is thinking about people who have no prior filmmaking knowledge or background, but who who's carrying a good iPhone or a Samsung or whatever, and um, who is interested to uh, you know start up a YouTube channel or something on social media. Um, what advice can you give them? Like you know, we get people who feel like, oh, I want to do something, but uh, I don't have a film background or I don't know what filmmaking is but hmm. most of them are carrying a great camera in their pocket Come yeah on. Steven Soderbergh yeah. made a feature film with an iPhone 7 a theatrical feature film so um, that means that yeah a lot of people are carrying a cinema camera in their pocket I know it's crazy the technology that we're carrying in our pockets nowadays um, you know, what advice? I mean, you still need to have a plan. Why are you doing it? I have people if who come want... to me and say like, I want to start a new YouTube channel or I want to do a short film or I want to film my kids and have it on YouTube. And how do I come about? So I, 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 I share whatever I can, but it'll be interesting to uh, see what yeah. advice you can give them. Um, I this is for non-film coming... people. Yeah. I always keep coming back to why you're doing it. I always ask people why. Okay. Like if you don't have a good why, you might film like one or two videos and then that's it. Yeah. Well, in most cases, I think that's where it's going to go, but yeah. If you do have like proper reason why you want to do it, say you want to keep documenting your kid's life for till their one week, every week till they're 21 because that's the memory you want to share with them when they get to that age. That's possibly a good why. True. And you are going to stick to filming every single week. Yeah. But it needs to be why, why do you want to do it? Like, why do you want to have a YouTube channel? What do you want to say? Like what makes people want to come to your channel as opposed to any other channel, like what's the thing? Um, in marketing, it's called uh, USP, unique selling proposition. Okay. What is your unique selling proposition? All right. And technology, by and large, it's so simple now. You, you pick up a couple of tutorials, you can do the basic stories. True. And now, um you can pretty much shoot, edit, and upload in one device, if I'm right. I yeah, mean, everything from iPhone. Yeah. So you don't even need extra edit suite True. or anything of that sort. But the key thing is, like, what's the purpose of doing it? Yeah. Well, for people like so us, if... I think we're not going to edit uh, our stuff on a phone because, you know, we want to tweak and fine tune yeah yeah we go into, yeah uh, totally detail yeah right different market right if on um if you're putting stuff on instagram it doesn't have to be as refined or as nice so i definitely would say ask yourself why you want to do it what's your selling proposition even though you're not actually selling of particular goods or services, you're selling a story. What is so good about the story that you have to tell it? Uh, if you can answer, if you find a good reason why, definitely don't let anyone tell you why you shouldn't do it. Okay. 
because at that point, all, the only person that matters is you. The audiences will come if the story is good. Where do you think uh, the future uh, for filmmaking is heading? I mean, since you know you're someone who is deeply rooted into it, I am someone who is into it. Um, where do you think this is heading? Because we know that the studio system is definitely um, affected by uh, the pandemic. And I'm sure that the local productions in New Zealand uh, must be halted right now. So nothing is being produced right there. So do you think, because I've, I've heard some filmmakers say that this is a great uh, time frame for independent filmmakers to start producing content uh, in whatever capacity they can. And there is an audience and a market for it. Do you agree with this or like? Yes and no. It's okay. interesting. Like obviously the pandemic shown there's a huge appetite for content. But we are also spoiled. So for instance, we watch a lot of stuff on Netflix. Yeah. The quality is very high. It's similar True. to um, a full-fledged production because they are spending that kind of money. True. So the medium might change. Okay. So it might go from full-on theater experience. It might shift towards a bit more smaller screen experience. Okay. But the cost of production is still going to remain high where, because people do have an expectation now. So as an independent filmmaker, it is great to make those independent projects because they are going to find an audience somewhere. And if they break through into the wider market, it's amazing because then you can actually access that bigger money to provide more value to the audience by making everything look nicer, tell bigger stories. Uh, so a case in the point for that, I'd say is, um, uh, who is it? Issa Rae. Okay. Um, she started off with a YouTube series All right. and it got so popular. And then she's doing a series. It's in fourth season now with HBO, Insecure. It's been just renewed for season five. And she's now also doing more feature films. Okay. Um, so you ultimately, you'd like to think that you can do something for very little money, true. which is true, you can, but you don't get access to a bigger market because then you're drowned out in that noise of content. Okay. Mm. There's nothing that makes it stand out more than every other project that's coming out. So that's the dilemma that we are in now, right? Like everyone's got technology in their pockets. Everyone's making content, so good. much content that you don't know what's good, what's not. <laughs> yeah. While you break through that noise and you get to a spot where more people are willing to trust their money yeah. for you to create bigger projects, which will find bigger audiences because they know what you're saying is worth it. In the long run, I think that also plays into it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't that's know if that. Um, yeah. Well, it, it's a different opinion, and I think uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's a good yeah. way of looking at it. Yeah. Because we want to keep growing as creatives, right? Like, True. otherwise, we are going to be in the same cycle all the all the way through. Yes which also means the kind of stories we tell will be limited in scope when True. the more value we can create, the better it is for everyone. <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, cover a lot about your traveling and um, your traveling as an individual and um, then um, the knowledge that you have gathered during uh, the production of your current documentary about, you know, different different countries and how how the Portuguese uh, culture influenced uh, 
different parts of the world. I mean, that's a vast uh, subject, so I don't know if we can cover all that today. Yeah, I mean, with travel, like, I'd like, I mean, I love traveling because I stay open. Um, but at the same time, I think I'm a poor traveler because I can't do the touristy things. All right, like? Um, so visiting a particular monument that everyone else is visiting, I go, oh my God, why? Like, I don't need to visit that monument. Okay. Like okay. if it's not, because monuments, yeah, sure, they're good. Not saying people shouldn't do it. But for me as a person, what interests me is food and people. Yeah. And understanding the moment of time that someone is in that particular space. Okay. So for me doing documentary like this, even though it's a lot of work, but it also forces me to kind of seek it out. All right. um, so for me, it's an enriching way of traveling. Okay. Where I'm capturing those moments and also just getting not doing stuff that I don't need to do because everyone else is doing it. All right. Yeah, it's um, it's been fascinating. Like even this, like um, there's a push. So Macau shut their borders first in mid Feb, and so I had to change a week out from the flight. I had to change my flight so i was like okay where can i go which still has a portuguese connection and i found that bangkok's got a portuguese connection okay which i never knew okay uh, i didn't know about that until now all right um portuguese were the first europeans to ever enter ayutthaya the okay Thai okay. and the only reason they didn't colonize uh is um the topography like the sea it's uh, i think it's uh, not deep water so they couldn't get the naval fleet in all right so they went in as traders at that point I mean, and they wanted to convert um as catholics uh, like uh, christianity they wanted to spread christianity okay so again i didn't know about so i've been to thailand a few times now Right. And this was the first time I found out about it because I was looking for it. So it's an interesting way of traveling because then it gives you a perspective where Bangkok, which is the least place you'd expect any kind of Portuguese mm -hmm. connection because Thai culture is very strong. Mm. Um, yeah. But then finding that connection there was amazing. Another thing uh, that's uh, that's quite interesting, uh, I'm yet to uh, figure this out, is like similar to how you, you know, make your content, you don't complicate your life uh, with traveling. You are so uh, simple the way you do it. Yeah. It doesn't feel like um, a huge burden to, you know, prepare yourself because like, you know, <laughs> um, to give you an example, like, I mean, if I'm going, if I'm traveling like, a hundred kilometers away from home um, we have to pack and it kind of like kills the mood <laughs> just for two nights yeah. right and then you are like you know you're like so <laughs> laid back and you just travel and no wait one, one reason being single i guess that that comes in handy too and yeah how do you do it like <laughs> yeah um on this journey i actually i think i had a suitcase with me which is, uh, which I'd say is um, way more than I, so I had a gimbal with me. Yeah. And I needed to have the gimbal in a harder case. You, you are you which talking about like, an actual, I, like a gimbal for your camera, your main camera? Yeah, a smaller oh, okay. gimbal. Uh, okay, okay. But ultimately I never used it at all because mm -hmm. I just didn't fit the kind of style that I was going for. Well, in that you don't find out till you actually hit the ground. Um, but the thing before this, I usually, 
like if I'm going with a suitcase, that's one more thing I'm wasting time at the airport for. Yeah. I have to wait 15, 20 minutes for the bags to come through. You're waiting at the conveyor belt. The last couple of projects, I only have my seven kg backpack. Okay. And like, if you're traveling full air, like not budget airlines, um, your camera bag is not counted towards your full weight capacity because that's okay. your. So I have my camera bag and my seven kg backpack, and that's how it makes it so easy to travel. You're not carrying so much stuff. True. Most of the places you go to, the hotels will have towels. So trying to minimize the amount you're lugging around. Yeah. Um, yeah, it eases the load. True. And makes yeah, your and travel also, experience much enjoyable, I reckon, because you have less things to you know worry about. Yeah, you don't Lighter have to worry you about like, yeah. packing. You know, you only have like five, six t-shirts and a couple of pairs of pants and underwear and that's about it <laughs> you're not gonna miss anything am i right if i say that you can access places faster due to this reason am i right if i say that yeah totally i mean also like there's been points where and this is not for documentary but there's been points when i was traveling just for leisure okay just being having just a backpack so good um, there was this point where I was, I did a trek in um, Borneo in, on okay. Mount Kinabalu. So you had to have like proper gear on, hiking gear and rain gear because it's um, a rainforest. Okay. And from there, I was going to US to do a camping trip before I was going to surprise my um cousin for her birthday okay and for the camping trip it was winter so i needed winter gear so i had all of this stuff all in my 7 kg backpack and the stopover was in frankfurt all right and it was a one day layover and as i was going to the airport how it happened i think the guy gave me incorrect instructions I caught the wrong train. I was going away from the airport as opposed to towards it. And uh, I got to the airport, Frankfurt airport, and I ran. I ran for my flight to the US. Okay. Um, and there was a massive line waiting to check their luggage in. Okay. Um, because I had no luggage to check in, I could bypass so uh, like i saved at least 45 minutes because i called the customer service line and they're like okay. you have to be at the gate now and i was like oh my okay. god just having like no luggage with you all right yeah i caught my flight the, i think the gate closed five minutes after i got there so i made my flight <laughs> so those are the pros yeah any 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 cons when you oh, are it's just you're kind of um, limited with figuring uh, out if you have enough clothes or not. Yeah. Especially when you're going into winter yeah. season. So something that my wife brought up, right? I mean, um, we watch uh, travel videos and we follow certain channels and something that we've noticed is um, the clothing and this affects hygiene standards. I think um, the South Asian mind is quite conscious about this. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm right. Um, so um, this is something she brought up. She's like, I wonder how uh, he washes his stuff because he's constantly traveling and he's wearing the same clothes. And she had an oh, issue yeah. with the hygiene standards. So how do you maintain that? Oh, simple. I know like, that some don't wash. Yeah, so. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I usually t um, find the nearest laundry mat and... Uh... Okay. Because most of the places, it's um, two hours service. You pay an extra dollar and you get it back. Sure, You're like, yeah, sure. sure. Like, okay. you just make 
some things you just spend money on. Laundry <laughs> yeah, is definitely one of them. All right. Okay. It's fantastic. Like, yeah. especially in Asia, it's so cheap getting laundry done. True, true. It's it's, and true. it's so fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, like I, I like to travel with icebreaker. I wear a lot of icebreakers. Okay. It's a brand with its merino t-shirts. All right. Um, so those don't um, retain smell. Oh. Um, and yeah, it, they keep you warm when it's cold and vice okay. versa. All right. So they are usually good for keeping the luggage weight down. All right. But I still, yeah, I still get them washed when it, like <laughs> every like. <laughs> I hope it was in not inappropriate i think it's an important question no, not no. many people pop no so, it's yeah. totally like it, that's also a whole part of the travel right yes. you have to figure out yeah. how many pairs of clothes you can take without yeah. overpacking yes. and how many you have to do before you have to give it to laundry yes so i usually yes. do all of those calculations as well before i start oh, okay all right so that's important yeah 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 no point traveling with so little clothes that you're you're having to go and shop every time yes but also not carry too much that uh, it becomes a burden so yeah when we were filming at hilton when the guy was making the kutu roti and i actually got to see the process start to end i was like oh my god this is so good so coming back here I kept going, trying to see why Seven Series isn't open. Oh, okay. because it's like I, because they make that right fresh in front of you, like back in Colombo. True. And yeah, so this um, new place that I found, I was like, ah, oh, roti, but it's in a packaged box. I was like, yeah, I'll try that. So okay. I bought it home. So good. Good. So good. So it's interesting yeah, it. uh, to hear you uh, talk about Sri Lankan cuisine, like, uh, yeah, like, I mean, I know you've been to like a lot of places, but you remembering uh, what's what and the tastes and the aroma and. Yeah. Oh, I mean, for me, yeah, I remember every food is something that really ties me to a place. Okay. Where, um, one of, I did a two week trip in Malaysia in 2012 All right. and that was purely to eat my way through Malaysia okay and the reason it came about was on the hiking trip that I did in Borneo I did a intrepid trip so we had a homestay okay. uh, it was in a farm and the grandma I woke up quite early about 4 30 4.45 to go to the restroom. Okay. And the grandma, she was already cooking food. And I was like, oh my God, like that's quite early to start prepping for breakfast. And I used the toilet, come out. And the smell was so good. So I just stopped. And the grandma, she couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Malay. She was just like, sit down. Like this is outside the house. And she like, sit down. And she just gave me the breakfast. So I just was eating as she was making the breakfast fresh at like 5 a.m. By the time everyone woke up and we were ready for breakfast about 6, 6.15ish, I'd already had like three servings of the breakfast. Okay. And the taste was so incredible. Yeah. And I was up to here and the grandma was like, some more? And I was like, ah, I can't eat, but I'm not going to get this anywhere else in the world. So he was like, yep. And that inspired me to travel to Mal like Peninsula Malaysia to eat my way through Malaysia. Okay. So yeah, food is such a important part. And yeah, I love, so every time I travel and come back, I like to try to find places from all the places I've been to and try the food here again, because that's a way for me to remember everything that I've been through. Did you really like Sri Lankan cuisine, like food? Um, 
Oh yeah, yeah. Like especially the shot eats, amazing <laughs> shot eats. Yeah, yeah. Like so good because so uh, and also uh, what was it the mutton rolls, uh, beef rolls. Yeah, the rolls. Yeah, the rolls was, and yeah, I try and find that wherever I can here. Yeah. Okay, you get one place in Auckland with mutton rolls. It's the same place you talked about that's closed down right now. That's where you used yeah. to get my mutton rolls from. Um, yeah, yeah, and also with the Sri Lankan cuisine, like it was. it was such a revelation like like the potu potu pitu. was that the pitu yeah pitu pitu as p i t t u pitu ah pitu yeah and um then um the double chicken and fan of kotu roti and yeah so yeah it's just it usually it's a for me it's a good way to kind of really experience the culture because food opens people up straight away true yeah they are a lot more open to you when they see that you really appreciate what yeah. you're eating true true yes but you should yeah. definitely so, uh visit sri lanka again and i'd be able to show you uh more around the country maybe like you know you know like plan for just a sri lankan trip maybe and um yeah. cover quite Different. a lot the cuisine changes from you know village to village town to town district to district and uh, there's yeah. so much to see you could make like a documentary just about that <laughs> that so, could be fascinating the cuisines of sri lanka and the influences that each of them ha- or what the influences were yeah. from each of the places because um I remember that um secret restaurant that I went to they had pole roti mm coconut roti yeah um but it was uh, with some uh, spice it, it, it had a filling right it had a filling and my memory of that is uh, the person telling me that that was a portuguese influence okay all right maybe okay so just knowing that the foods had different influence from different uh places like the dutch had a particular influence as well and you have thosai which is mm. dosas which is similar to sh- indian south indian, indian food yeah yeah it's a yeah i would love to actually how, how did you find the rice and curry you tried rice and curry the, when you were here right Yeah, I tried the lump rice. Okay, that's not rice. Or, you get like, you know, white or red rice. Then you get about three vegetable curries in one protein, like a meat mm, curry. No, it's all I curry. I think I tried that. That is like <laughs> my favorite. I think another reason why I'm living here when I have the opportunity to settle anywhere else in the world is the food. <laughs> yeah, it just yeah. brings me back. Obviously, family, but you know, like yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's the food like you know i can't get that anywhere else i go i mean i love food where i yeah. go but you you know what i mean right like yeah, yeah totally like i mean i'm from um, originally from from again like a mixture of two cultures even in india i was born in uh, andhra which is now two states uh, and i grew up in delhi so south indian culture is completely different to north indian culture okay but i still crave like dosas and idlis and uttapams which is like very south indian things okay and it's so hard finding good food like that here so you're like ah yeah. show there yeah that's something i didn't like about living in new zealand is yeah i had problems with food you know i like the pies i like the burgers i like the barbecues but yeah <laughs> i missed my food yeah 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 it, i think new zealand's gotten better okay. over the years but again it will be interesting what this pandemic does true like how do people survive this mm. you need i mean 
one of the things that people most cut back on is um, leisure food okay. or food outings. All right. Which means less spending money and they, yeah, we'll, we'll find out which restaurants survive and which don't in a while. Mm. So I always try and spend money on the places that I really love to eat. Okay. Because I want them to survive. I want them to be there for a long, long time. I mean, I have a lot to talk, but I think we'll uh, conclude the the, sh- the the episode for today. But I'd really like to have you as a guest for a future episode to discuss more about um, the spice route, the history behind it, and just totally focus on that, maybe, um, if you are cool for that in the future. Definitely. In the future, yes. And yeah, it w- would love to. Yeah. I don't know how much I covered, you know, you always feel like you could have covered more, but then, you know, you're just figuring out how to keep it going yeah. and balancing everything out. And so in any case, I think uh, we had a, I, I really enjoyed the podcast. It was excellent. Yeah. And, and same, like it uh, definitely made me think of some of the things I did, like rummaging through my memory banks, because it just does feel like another lifetime ago. True. Okay. I'm glad that you uh, enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Ray. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge and your experiences. And I'd really love to have you back uh, in the future. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening to uh, the Martin Stein Encounter and I'll see you soon. <laughs>